I want to welcome you today. It's good to be with you. Good to see you out there. I want to welcome our online audience also. Let's go ahead and take a moment and pray together. Lord, now we bow before you, the great and mighty King, the one who has set his love on us, the one who from all eternity saw us before we were even born, saw us and knit us together in our mother's womb, knows each day before it even occurs, has the hairs of our heads numbered. You speak to us through your word, which is a light unto our path, lamp unto our feet. It is like the rain or snow that falls from the atmosphere. It goes to the ground and accomplishes a purpose. And in the case of your word, the purpose for which you sent it, it's living and act active. It divides the deepest parts of us compared to joints and marrow. It divides and judges the thoughts of the heart. So we thank you, God, for your word for this moment and for this time we have together to sit before you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would brighten our minds, a sharpness that we could hear what you have for us today. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you. How are you? Good? Okay, good. Um, I, I think it's great that people listen to Bible teachers. I think it's a great supplement. I, I have had periods in my life when I've done that, and I think it's very good. But I don't think TV pastors are as good as local pastors. Now, of course, I'm a local pastor. It's not that they're not as good. It's just that the difference is that they can speak on generalities, but I have the particular calling, and I hope as a pastor, the gifting of reading you, reading the situation of our day, and speaking to you what you need. You know, you wouldn't go to a doctor, although we do go to doctors and say, well, what do you do for a rash? You, you, you know, you might do that, but you really need to go to a specific person and say, look at this rash and what you do. So I've been thinking a lot about what's going on in all of your lives and all of our lives, trying to get the pulse of both our culture and our congregation, and that's what I'm going to speak to you about today as it relates to Genesis 3, and particularly the anatomy of temptation. Um, German theologian Karl Barth famously said, take your Bible and your newspaper and read both, but interpret newspapers from the Bible. And so that's what I'm going to do today. We're going to look at the world we're living in, in and through the Bible, and particularly, as I said, through Genesis chapter 3. Now, I want you to speak back to me here. I really probably should have gotten a whiteboard up here to write down some of your answers. If you were to pick one word to describe the COVID era, what word would you choose? Go ahead and shout out a couple. Scary. Scary. Chaos. Isolation. Isolation. Who said division? Okay, division. Any other words you want to throw out? Censorship. Okay. Can't say it here. <laughs> That's Dan over there. Was that you, Dan? <laughs> That's good. That's really good. Can't say it here. Yeah. We probably all have a few of those words about this era, right? Well, Bill, the word I was going to pick was division, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. Because we are living with, I don't know about you, but divided families, right? Families are dividing. Um, even marriages are dividing. We have a divided country, and we have, yes, we have divided churches, don't we? So there's division everywhere. If you were here about a year ago, you might remember that just before the election, I gave a talk on unity, and I talked about the base word behind the name devil or diabolos. Now, stay there. Don't give away what it means. We'll see how many of you remember. You know, I want to tell you that that message probably is the message in the course of my at least memorable career that I got the most um, critical feedback about. Uh, people were not happy. You know, some of my very best friends weren't happy with that. Um, and I accept that. But I, I, I think if you know me, I always give my best, and I try to hear from God. So... I, if you didn't like it, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, let's go back to Diabolos. Uh, does anybody, anybody remember what Diabolos means? <laughs> so it was a really impactful message, right? <laughs> you guys remember it. It's so awesome. <laughs> Diabolos means divider. And it's the word we get, we get translated devil. So Diabolos is divider. Now keep that word in mind as we read God's word this morning, that the Bible paints the evil spiritual force in the world as diabolos in chief, divider in chief. 
Now I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 3 here, the first seven verses. You're certainly welcome to follow along. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's word this morning? I'll be reading as I said. Genesis 3 verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is God's word. Please grab a seat. Now I'm going to excerpt a part of that. Look at what the serpent does here. I'm going to read it again. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So I want to just point this out to you. What is the first act of the serpent, who is a personification of the devil, before he even, utter, utter, yeah, right, before he even utters a word, do you see what he does first? What does he do first? Now, it, it may not be that obvious. It's never been that obvious to me. He said to the woman. Now, does anything about that strike you as strange? He said to the woman. He didn't say it to the man. He didn't say it to both of them, right? The serpent, again, who's the devil in the shape or form of a snake, approaches her when she is what? Exactly, when she's alone. What does he do? He singles her out. So the first evil act of the Bible, what is the first evil act of the Bible? It's an act of dividing two people who are united apart from each other. First thing that happens. Have you ever seen that before? I don't think I had kind of concentrate on what he said. But the first thing he does is he divide two, divides two people who are united. Now, um, you probably, we've probably all seen those nature shows where they you know, show how animals you know, predate and all those kinds of things. Um, if you've watched those, and I think everybody has, um, what does a predatory animal do when it's looking for a prey? What does it do first? It looks for either a weak animal or one that has been separated from the herd, doesn't it? Because when an animal is in its herd, there's all, I read about this, there's all kinds of reasons why it's hard. You know, the, the visual effect of a large herd of, let's say, buffalo or whatever the uh, animal is that's being preyed upon by, let's say, the wolf. Um, they look for that one that's been separated off. And what does the serpent do? He, he acts exactly like that. He acts like a predatory wolf isolating off his prey. So the first thing I want you to see this morning is this. You are most vulnerable to temptation when you are alone. You hear me? most vulnerable when you are alone. And the more you are in community, in relationship, the less likely you are to fall prey to temptation. I don't know how many of you are in the recovery community, whether it's AA or NA or one of the groups, but they have this uh, phrase I, I've always liked, and it is, you're only as sick as your secrets. Now, if you are tempted to do something dishonest, tell someone you trust. If you're tempted to betray a friend, tell someone you trust. If you're in a season of your life where you're questioning God, get with someone who knows him, not with a group of people who are also questioning God. You may have conversations with them, but the devil wants to get you alone where he can divide you from your community of believing. Did you hear that? He wants to pull you out and get you, get you alone. And if you don't have someone like that, that you can tell that kind of thing to, to pray that God would provide such a person. I know that can be hard to find someone you trust, but it's very important. Now let's move on. Let's look at the first words out of the serpent's mouth as he moves in on Eve, as he isolates her off. And it is this, did God really say? Now, let me help you feel the import of his uh, line of questioning. Here's the bottom line. The first thing he does to soften her up, I have always said, you know, he first questions God, but what does he really, who does he first question? He first questions her 
he causes her first to question herself. Did I hear that right? Did he really say this? And then he's going to question God. But did he really? He's first causing her to question her own thinking. Um, I told you earlier this year that my wife and I had a you know, trip of a lifetime, a dream trip to Hawaii this summer. And one of the things, and if you've been to uh, Maui in particular, you know that one of the things that many tourists do there is they travel what's called the road to Hana. How many of you have done the road to Hana? Yeah, okay, so quite a few of you. Okay, um, it's a fascinating road because I looked this up this morning. It, it's 64 miles long, 25 mile an hour speed limit, which is a joke because you never get to that speed. It has 620 hairpin curves and 59 one-way bridges. Okay, so I mean, you're just constantly turning, waiting for traffic across one-way bridges. Um, so it's quite a, it's, it's an epic drive. It takes a couple of hours at best, a couple of, you know, two and a half hours if you don't have too much traffic. What people tend to do is they stop at um, waterfalls along the way. My wife and I heard about the strategy to go to the very end and then kind of work your way back so you wouldn't have the crowds, and that worked really well. So we went to the end of the road, of, uh, road to Hana, and at the end there is what's called, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, the Pippawa Trail, um, Pippawa Trail. And what you do is you get on this trail, it's about two and a half miles long, and you um, walk in through a bamboo forest, and at the end of it, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this, is the Waiamuku Falls. Um, and there's this beautiful falls, 400 feet high, that is just one of those epic places you have to see in Maui. Now, I found my video that I took when we got to the end of that trail, and I want you to notice the words I used to describe the sign and the threat of going beyond this sign, because they sound a lot like what God said, you know, don't eat the tree, because in the day you eat it, you will die. Now, take a look at my video here of our visit there. Okay, we're here at the falls at the end of the... Pippawa Trail, Pippawee, however you say it. I think it's 300 feet up. 400 feet. Comes down and then it says, do not pass this point, you will die. And you can just see around us. Now, we were there, we were some of the first people there because of the way we did it. So there were like three cars in front of us, it opened at 815 and we you know, hiked up that trail pretty quick. We had a big day in front of us. And when we got to the foot of the falls and we saw that sign, which was probably about 100 feet from the bottom of the falls, you know, what do you think I did? Went past it. Thank you for that. Uh, no, I, I actually didn't. Um, I didn't go past it. But, you know, I think someone had because there was a set of shoes and like a shirt there. So someone had gone past it. But I, I didn't gather from that uh, enough to kind of go past it. But you know, I said, oh, darn, you know, darn, I really would like to have, you know, seen it from the bottom. And so, you know, we actually, then there was a little tributary down here and a little uh, pooling of water. So, you know, we had our bathing suits on and we just kind of, you know, bathed there and just enjoyed our little moment there. Um, so I didn't go past it, but I was a little disappointed because I thought you could. Then I get back here be because uh, I returned to church and Rachel Hardy, Rachel's back there in the booth. She's our worship director. She had been about a month before, and I said, oh, yeah, we went to the Pippawa Trail, we went to the end there, Waimoka Falls, but, you know, we saw that sign, she said, oh, yeah, everybody ignored that. <laughs> she was there when it was a little busy, she said, everybody's going past that, and, and, and you did, right, Rachel? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and you know what I said when I heard that? I said, oh, darn, I wish I'd known, I would have gone past it. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing, so, you know, I, I was thinking, no, I don't. Remember. Now, what... You know, what was going through my head, or what was going through Rachel's head, and what was going through my head when I looked at that sign was, does anybody really die here? I mean, is this really dangerous? Now, what would I have been doing there? I would have been doubting the prohibition, right? I would have been questioning myself like, eh, you know, I'll probably get away with this. Maybe it's not that dangerous. You know, and I would have been thinking, the government here is just trying to keep me from something good like government does. They're just trying to keep me from something good. Now, just to give you an idea of someone who did that trail, and it's not Rachel Hardy, I came across this video. So when I looked up Pippo Trail, this video came up. And I have it play a little longer than you might think, because I want you to watch how rattled these people are. Go ahead and show that second video.
the rock is well. That's why. Yeah, that was scary. Okay, so I almost died. We almost died. It was closer to Ben than me. Um, rock <laughs> fell from somewhere way up there and uh, landed about five feet from where we were standing. Yep. So, so don't cross the line. If yeah. It's more than a hundred dollar fine. It yeah. Could be your life. Yeah, that would have. Anyways, so here we are, alive. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Yep. Anywho, um, that yeah. Happened. Uh, time to. Time to go. Get our breath. <laughs> that was a. Uh, that's a big downer. <laughs> They didn't listen to that prohibition, right? They questioned it. They saw other people doing it, thought maybe it was okay. Um, when I looked up this story, it said Pippawa Trail deaths. In 2011, a young girl from Maui did the same thing they did, except she was hit by that rock and killed. So people really do get killed there. So let me come back to that phrase. Did God really say? Do you see what the devil is doing here? He's sowing doubts in their minds about that sign. You sure you heard him right? Keeping you from something good. You should probably just go to that tree. Now, I don't know everything by any means that God has or is going to say to you, but I know one thing he's going to say to you, one thing he says to every single one of you. He says, come to me, move toward me, move out of the darkness and into the light and start living with me. Put me first. Put me first. I know he tells you that. But you think, oh, do I really want to turn toward God and away from so-called wisdom of the world? Is that really the best way to live? You know, you're doubting yourself and you're doubting God, just like people doubting that sign. Now, look at what the Apostle James wrote in his letter. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to show you part of it again. So I'm going to show it to you twice. Where You're going to hear it twice. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, even demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace will reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, do you see how different God's kind of wisdom is? The world's wisdom says, and young people, this is probably especially true for you, compete on the basis of looks, or for us adults in the corporate world, climb on the backs of others to get where you want to be. And so whether you're in high school or a corporate office, the world's wisdom is based on promoting the self and not caring about the other person. You know that? That's all over the world right now, and our kids are devastated by the competitive environment of social media, by that competitive environment they live in. We're bombarded by people who promote their individual brand, and then when they get their platform, they tell us how we should live. Why do we listen to them? Why would we listen to someone whose main claim to fame is that they look good on the internet? Why, would we do, why, why should I care what George Clooney says about anything? Or Angelina Jolie? I mean, what, you know, are they like political science you know, geniuses? But we do, right? Why would we do that? Young people, what qualifies as an influencer to give you wisdom on how, do you, how to live. You know, they may look really good on their online line profiles and you decide they have something to say. But you know what God calls that? God says that's foolishness. It's called listening to the world's wisdom and he calls it pure foolishness. Look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 3. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Now, look at one of God's influencers again. I want to show it to you this time from James. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, in other words, oh, I wish I looked like her or was as good as him at that or, you know, as smart as them, don't boast about it or deny the truth. That kind of wisdom, it doesn't come from heaven. It's earthly. It's unspiritual. It's even demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, I'm better than you, I'm faster than you, I'm not as good as you, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Is that as old as James and as new as yesterday on the internet or what? 
But the wisdom that comes from heaven is very different. It's, first of all, it's pure. That's the kind of wisdom it is. It's peace-loving, considerate. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So I'm going to ask you, what's your conversation like? Is it, is it a pure conversation? Is it peace-loving? You know, we're talking about division today. Is it peace-loving? Is it considerate and submissive and full of good fruit and impartial and sincere? And we get all of this just from that first little line, did God really say? Because the temptation to distrust God and give heed to other voices, whether directly from the serpent or from the same evil dividing impulse online, is as old as the scene in Genesis 3 and as recent as this week in your life. The devil, the divider, first wants Eve to doubt herself, then he wants her to doubt God, and look at what he says. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, this is interesting, and I don't think I've ever seen this before, and I've spent a lot of time in this passage. Let's just do some fact-checking here. You know, what did God say? Let's look at Genesis 2, 16 through 17. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, let's just put those two statements up against each other. Okay, you got the one from the devil and the one from God. There's the devil. You must not eat from any, did God say this? You must not eat from any tree in the garden. Is that what God said? And what did God said? You are free, free to eat from any tree in the garden. I mean, I heard some chuckles. It's kind of interesting, right? Don't eat from any tree in the garden. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden. And then, of course, he does add a, uh, you know, a uh, restriction. Now, I want to show you the Hebrew from those two texts. And there's only two differences. Now, I know you don't know Hebrew, but the helpful thing about interlinears is it breaks it down. As I've told you before, um, Hebrew is unusual and difficult because you don't read from left to right, but from right to left. So, and it, the word sequences will feel different to us. Of every tree of the garden, I'm reading the orange here, of every tree of the garden, freely you may eat. Now, I, I just want you to see that. Okay? Now, let's look at what Satan says. Not you shall eat of every tree of the garden. Now, I'm going to just ask you, you know, I'm going to ask you to do a little Hebrew this morning. What's the difference between those two verses? You say he adds the word no, right? Not of every tree shall you eat. So the divider, oh, he did drop one word. Go back to the other one, oh, the other Hebrew one. What's the word in this one that's missing in Satan's? Okay, you got it. You, you can do some Hebrew. And what's... <laughs> So he drops the word freely, and what's the word he ad adds? Exactly. Drops the word freely, adds the word not, and again, take a look at that. I have it underlined in this next, next verse, or next slide. Go ahead. Keep going. You're moving? Okay. <laughs> you are free to eat from every tree in the garden, as God said. You must not eat from any tree in the garden. You see what the divider's trying to do? You see it? He wants to blind us. Listen to me. He wants to blind us to the freedom that God has for us, and he wants to tell us that God's all about saying no to things. And he's been doing that ever since. Let me say it again. He wants to blind you to the freedom that God wants you to have in him, and he wants you to make think God is all about keeping you from things that are good, just like that sign on the Pippa Wood Trail. Now, if you ask the average person if their perception of God is of him, do you think they more, are more likely to say that he's a being who constrains or frees people? constraints, right? You know, is a God who, in, you know, is God a being who loves us enjoying life or is he about limiting our fun? I think we all know the answer to that. And that is, that's the divider at work dividing people from God. You know, look at the garden, Adam and Eve. You can freely eat everything here. You are free. But I have one prohibition in the garden to find out if you're going to choose to live with me or against me. And they tragically do what? They listen to the divider and they go against God. Now, before I apply this, I want to answer a couple questions I heard that are circulating in some of our small groups. You may be in a group that's discussing this stuff. And Vicki said, hey, Mark, you might want to address these. And here's the question I heard. Why did God put a tree that they couldn't eat from, and why did he allow the devil to tempt them? Anybody been asking that question? You know, it seems like a pretty good question. And I said to her, very simple answer. Here it is. Because this was a period of probation to test their loyalty. 
And the test had to happen before they could have children because they were acting as our representative heads of the human race. So he allows the serpent to precipitate a crisis of loyalty. And how is he going to make that happen? He says, okay, go ahead. Let's see how they're going to go. That's why he puts the tree of prohibition in, and that's why he allows the tempter in to precipitate that crisis moment where they could have said, you're out of here. Now, let me apply this lesson on freedom and restraint. Um, you're going to love this. I'm going to talk about money and sex now. Why not? Okay. When I began to follow God in my 20s, the man, a man named Tom Wilkerson, who influenced me to Christ, told me that Christians tithe. He said they give 10% of their income to God. So I was just in my first job, so I put 10% aside, and I've never really looked back from that. Now, watch how you can think about that. You might think, give 10% to God. That's a lot of money. I'm not sure I could do that. Or you could think, now, wait a second. God tells me that everything I have comes from him. You know, that passage, what do you have that you've not been given? Um, so everything belongs to him. And he says you can keep freely 90% of it. Well, that's pretty generous. I mean, which way do we view it? Say, thank you, God, I get to honor you. You know, you've given me so much. You know, I'm glad to give this back to you. And then you watch God show his faithfulness to you when you're faithful to him because he tends to bless that kind of thing because when you live on 90%, there's a blessing that accrues to that kind of financial management. I've seen it in my life, my whole life. Or do you say, that's too much to ask. God can never have 10%. I can never live on that. The people I know who live generously to God are the most free people in, that I know in terms of their finances because of that blessing that accrues to that kind of discipline and giving to God. Here's another obvious one. I've given you your sexuality to enjoy, to procreate, to unify you in marriage. You are free but I want it to be expressed in a covenantal relationship. That's where I'm going to bless you. And you, people say, oh, that's just too restrictive. Now, the divider is always there to make us question whether we heard God, God right. Does he really mean that? Did he say this? And the end game is to divide and to separate you from God and his goodness. Now, let me just take a step back and give you a larger perspective on Genesis 3 that I want you to kind of go away with today. When evil personified in the serpent entered the world, his strategy was a strategy of division on every level. But first and foremost, he was trying to divide us from God, right? And the first story of temptation shows this tragic estrangement. They go from freedom, like, hey, everything's good. They're naked and unashamed, to what? What's the thing they do? You know, what's the first thing they do? They cover themselves, and what do they do? They go into hiding, exactly. But we may miss the larger narrative of this story if we miss God's reaction to the separation. First, God gives consequences in the form of curses. Bad things will happen because of the choice to push God away, the choice to reject God's truth for another truth, and to believe that the devil's a truth teller and God's a liar, and he's just trying to keep good things from them like that Pippa Trail sign. Then God banishes them from the place of union with him. And I want to say to you, this in a way, is the turning point of the entire Bible right here in the third chapter. Because from now on, union, union with God is no longer going to be free. It's costly, and someone's going to have to pay for the wrongdoing. Because in God's world, in a just world, wrong never goes unpunished because it goes against the fabric of the universe and the nature of God. People weren't meant to kill each other. We weren't meant to use our power to exploit one another. We weren't designed to ignore our creator and worship created things instead of the creator, as Paul said. So the rest of the Bible, listen very carefully, is a story of the price that has to be paid for sin to be erased from the picture so we can be with God again. And it begins in Genesis 3 when God takes an innocent sufferer, an animal, and kills it so he can put skins on Adam and Eve, right? It's the first innocent sacrifice. It's a, it's a sign. In theology he called it an adumbration. In other words, it's like a, a shadow of what's to come. The second thing that happens is he creates a people unto himself called Israel, and he creates a sacrificial system and says, there's going to be an atonement, and someone can pay for your sin. And it culminates in the person of Jesus Christ on a cross outside Jerusalem when the only innocent sufferer that ever was, hangs on a cross and is forsaken by God the Father for you so that you can have what you were created to have, the chance to live in God's realm with perfect unity with him like where I was in the garden, to live 
and make together the kind of world God wants it to be. In the opening chapters of Genesis, what's talked about is access to the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life. In the New Testament, Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come in me, and we're all invited into that kingdom. And why is that? Well, let me, I always like to tell this to people in the membership class. In evangelical churches, we like to tell people that it's all by grace, that it's by grace we come to God. That's true. But I always like to tell them there was one time in history where there was a covenant of works where we could have earned our favor with God. And it was Adam in the garden. Obey this one rule, and we'll have fellowship forever. And when he didn't, what's going to happen? Who's going to obey that covenant of works? Who's going to keep the law and give us access to the tree of life? We're lost. We can never get access to the tree of life again, except what happens in the gospel. According to Paul in Romans 5, 6, he says there's a second Adam who perfectly fulfills the law for us, and we get access to the tree of life now. The whole Bible's like this parenthesis between the moment when we could have gotten it right in the covenant of works, we have our substitute against the covenant of works for us, and then says, now you come in on the basis of grace. Adam didn't do it. I did. Now you come in and ride my back. You hear me? It's a remarkable overarching narrative of the Bible. Now, I know I'm throwing some big theological truths out there, but that's the concentration of these early chapters of Genesis. Um, I got up last Saturday morning, and... Uh, I felt really sad and depressed. And I decided it was because I was sick of hearing about all the things that were wrong in the world. Anybody else feel that way these days? Okay, I get a few hands, a couple, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you watch the news, you listen to things, it just sounds like, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? Just, what a terrible world. I just like, bring you down all the time. I mean, COVID is killing more people than it did last year, or whatever we're hearing. The border is overwhelmed with immigrants pouring into our country and nobody's doing anything about it. You know, look at the stories about school board meetings. Uh, you know, some of you may be on school boards. You know, you know how tough that is. Um, we're racially divided and politically divided and religiously divided. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring you down, but, I'm, you know, that's what we're all feeling, right? And I decided on Saturday, I thought, I don't want to live in that kind of world. And I have to tell you something. God doesn't want me to live in it either. He doesn't want you to live in it either. Um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I have dual citizenship. Did you know that? Um, I'm a citizen of America, and I'm also a citizen of the kingdom of God. <laughs> and so are you. Now, let me just ask a quick, simple question. Which one should be our first loyalty? Citizenship to America or citizenship to the kingdom of God? Say it together. The of God. Exactly, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not in trouble, okay? The kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of free people, a kingdom of people who love freely and are loved freely. It's a kingdom of people who are making a difference in the world. I'm sure globally, but locally we are. I always tell these stories because I love them because I have such a good friendship with the CEO of Agros, but Alberto Solano called me this past week because they had what they call Tierra, um, PDV, Tierra de Vida, um, which um, is... Uh, I have the name wrong, but it's their annual uh, fundraising thing. And he said, I wanted to thank you because, because of your church's generosity. We were looking at getting 20 new families into communities in uh, Tierra Nueva and San Benito and La Benedicción. Um, but instead, because the giving was so strong and you, your church was part of it, we were able to move 30 or 40 people out of extreme poverty into that community. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you watch the news, they're always talking about the border. And about all the people who are coming up from Central America. Have you heard that? And everybody's mad at Camilla because she's not going down there and all this stuff. And, you know, Mayorkas and all this stuff. And it's because the people are coming up, you know, from these countries. Like Guatemala and Nicaragua. And they don't know what to do. Can I tell you something? We know what to do. We give money to an organization that takes people in severe poverty and says, we're going give, to give you a house, you're going to get a field, and then you're going to pay it off, and then you're going to own it. And that's exactly what is happening. And I was talking to Alberto about going down next year. He said, when you go down to uh, San Benito and La Benedicción, people will be getting their titles because they've earned it because their coffee farms have done so well. And the United States goes, I don't know what to do about it. And the church says, we know what to do about it. We're helping people right down there. In the kingdom of God, that's the way it works. In the kingdom of God, listen carefully, people are choosing to forgive petty offenses and lean in the, into their unity and not let the divider pull us apart. Do you hear me? Look at what Paul said in Galatians 3. So in Christ Jesus, 
you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You're included in him. There is now neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor, there is, uh, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, so part of that family, and heirs according to the promise. So let me just ask every one of you, online, in person, today, listening today live, or listening in the future, are you a kingdom man? Are you a kingdom woman? Are you a kingdom teen, a kingdom child? Because if you are, let me just tell you something. You don't have to live by the rules of the world anymore. Do you know if you go like to the American embassy in some foreign country, someone was telling me this recently, reminded me of this, you know, you live by American rules over there. Well, if you're a member of the kingdom of God, wherever you are, you live by kingdom rules. You are under that authority. And so I patently reject any worldview that divides me from anybody. Amen? I completely reject the kind of thinking that puts me at odds with someone because they are different from me. I reject that. And I want to tell you, I and you, I get to be an influencer. And my message is this. God invites everybody into that kingdom. And so I would say, come through the washing water of redemption of the blood of Christ and follow Jesus into his kingdom of love. That's what we're invited into. Now, closing thought. In the book of Revelation, one of the symbols that is used is the seven trumpets. And each one, actually each one of the first six, carry with it a plague. And it's a warning of what's about to take place. But the seventh trumpet is different. It announces the end. All the judgments are done. And here's what it says in Revelation 11, 15. The kingdom of the world has become, it's been overshadowed, it's been run over. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And I am part of that kingdom, and you are part of that kingdom. And if you're not, you can come into that kingdom, and it's the kingdom of freedom, the freedom to be truly human and to fully image the God who made you to be beautiful and to love beauty. That's the message of God to you today. I'm a member of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of the world, I'm in the kingdom of God, and so are you. Don't let the divider win the battle to divide you from anybody. He tried to do it in Genesis 3, and he's been trying to do it ever since, and he seems to be winning the day to day, but not in the kingdom I live in, not in this church. Let's pray together. Lord, we are in a battle, but we're in a winning battle because your kingdom, one day, as it says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah. Like a giant spiritual steamroller, you're going to roll over the kingdom that has been polluted by the tempter who wants to divide us. And I reject his strategies. I will not fall prey to his predatory actions on me, my church, my family. I will not divide. But I will unite around the love I have for Jesus Christ and the work he's doing to always create in me the image of God and all the people who are listening to me today. So Lord, give us that hope and give us the strength to see what he's doing and to tell him there's no place for you here and you are headed to destruction. And that's a fact. And we pray that in Jesus' name.